We're now into the second day of mourning here in the Netherlands for Peter de Vries, the investigative crime journalist. We are appalled died by the apparently the arbitrary killing of nine activists in simultaneous... Tonight, more bloodshed in Mexico. Another journalist killed this week in the country. Five he was known for fighting for the little guys, for trying to dig out From the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, this is the Repo Effect. This is The Ripple Effect, and I'm your host, Ana Paula Oliveira. In our last episode, we go back to an issue that underpins most contract killings, impunity. With impunity rates so high for the murder of journalists, human rights defenders, environmentalists and others, it can sometimes feel like a losing battle. But convictions can be secured, corruption that leads to assassinations can be exposed, and the masterminds put behind bars. What changes are needed to disrupt the system of collusion that enables impunity for contract killings? And how can the international community step in? The first, I think, that... Agnes Kalamad, Secretary General of Amnesty International and former UN Special Rapporteur in Extrajudicial Killing, give us her thoughts on the steps that the international community can take to put pressure on states and individuals to tackle assassinations. The first recommendation for the so-called international community, here well, let's talk about states, government, the executives. What we want is them to be courageous. We want them to be prepared to name a country that fails to investigate properly, a country whose political system is embroiled with organized crime that needs to be named, and uh, the killings of those who are denouncing and reporting on this corruption, those killings must be the object of very clear, very public denunciations by members of the international community. That will already go, in my view, a long way towards sending a very clear message to member states around the world, to countries around the world, that if their politicians are prepared to engage into this murder for hire, they must be prepared for the consequences of this act. Sending such a message at all levels possible of the international community, from other governments to the Secretary General, to the head of the uh, Human Rights Council, and so on. The second recommendation I, I will make in addition is with regard to more preventative measures. And here I have recommended that countries adopt something that I call the Khashoggi sanctions. What I mean by the Khashoggi sanctions is a program of sanctions that are individualized. I'm not speaking about sanctioning a country. I'm speaking about sanctioning individuals who, through their action, have threatened those who are standing up to corruption, standing up to human rights violation, and so on. So they may be journalists, human rights defenders, civil society activists, dissidents, whoever they are. In the previous episode, we learned how the international community was influential in exposing the corruption in Malta that led to Daphne Caruana Galicia's murder. Agnes feels these efforts can be replicated in other parts of the world. I have absolutely no doubt that it can be duplicated elsewhere where there are regional institutions. So there is no reason why the inter-American system could not do what the European system did in the case of Malta. There is no uh, reason why the African system could not proceed along the same lines of what the European system did in the case of Malta. All it needs, really, at the end of the day, is courage, is political courage, because institutionally, those three systems have the capacity to carry out these kind of studies. The involvement of regional or international organization is possible in those emblematic cases in particular. I don't think we can expect them to do so for every killing. But if they do it on a couple of them that become emblematic, I think it will have ripple effect throughout the region. 
We have looked at Italy and its strong response to the assassination of Judge Giovanni Falcone previously. Italy continues to crack down on organized crime. The largest mafia trial in over three decades is starting in Italy. The defendants include... Judge Antonio Balsamo is president of the Tribunal of Palermo. He outlines his recommendations of the necessary conditions that need to be in place for countries to tackle impunity. First, the creation of specialized judicial bodies capable of ensuring the continuity of focus on complex organized crime-related phenomena. This can be achieved through the coordination of investigation on a natural scale and the confirmation of the judiciary system to the nature of this, uh, of the, of this very complex phenomenon. The second condition is the strengthening of the use of uh, special investigative techniques such as the undercover operations and electronic surveillance. This shall be included the international uh, judicial cooperation agendas through bilateral or multilateral agreements. By doing so, prosecutors from different countries will be able to collect uh, and use in courts information of extreme importance. Third, also with regards to uh, international cooperation, is the development of bilateral and multilateral agreements, but this time which allow for recognition of a uh, transitional status of uh, the collaborator of justice. These are figures which are essential for the investigative process. It is important to remember that during any investigation, there is a family at the center of it searching for answers. This is going to be a very long process. E even the legal proceedings themselves will go on for years, even if they're not sabotaged. Judge Antonio also points to their contribution to assisting prosecution. The importance of uh, assisting the victims' families should not be underestimated. Only by building a trust-based relationship, they open up to a positive attitude towards the judicial system and then are more willing to contribute significantly uh, to the reconstruction of the truth. There is a lot of work to be done in this field and during my career I happened to meet family members who have even denied that their relative had been a, a victim of a murder, but also on the other side families who have um, always had an unbreakable faith in the judicial system. A person who for me represents the symbol of this faith is the father of a police officer killed in the 80s in Palermo, Antonino D'Agostini. The father always believed uh, throughout his life in the ability of the judges and in the judiciary itself to find the killers and eventually imprison them and punish them. And perhaps his hope uh, will be satisfied. There may always be some limitation on the capabilities of the practical forensic side of investigations. But for Steve Camodi, director of programs of the Wildlife Justice Commission, this is not an issue. The, at the investigations level, you know, we have advances, we have, you know, excellent forensic techniques out there now. The capabilities now are much better than even five years ago. That side of it, it, it I don't personally see as the issue. Whilst there are obviously shortcomings in certain countries, that's an area where it's a relatively easy fix. It, it may cost a bit of money, but it's, it's easy to fix. For me, the, the issues are much more about the political will to, to, to tackle these things or the international political will. From lessons learned, the lessons I've seen are that if you have the political will and the support of the government and the prosecution services to go after these people, well then those barriers around that the corruption put in place are removed somewhat. But if that political will is not there, or you work, you know, you're in a system where the, where the government is corrupt. You know, you have the very top levels of, of government organizing these hits. That's a much harder win for, for law enforcement to get within that country. And that's when you do need those international and regional mechanisms. There's no world policeman. There's no agency that's going to fly in it and sort this out at the moment. There needs to be something that motivates these governments to change. And that needs to be pressure exerted from outside. Agnes Kalama echoes the need for political will to push things forward to bring an end to impunity. As an international community, I think we need to be far better prepared to respond to those targeted killing, hit killings, hit assassinations, particularly because they are not going to go down. And the more we speak up, the more we act against them, the more we make it clear that both the hitmen and those at commission Uh, the crimes will be identified and prosecuted, 
that to me is the strongest message we can send and it is the strongest and most effective way to fight against impunity. Throughout this series, we have sought to shine a light on the ripple effect contract killings have on people's lives and our societies. If these crimes are tolerated, if there is no political will to challenge corruption and organize crime infiltration in state institutions, then a system of impunity remains the status quo. Our guests have outlined their recommendations for challenging these crimes and ultimately preventing further assassinations and saving lives. There remain local, regional and international efforts to protect human rights activists, politicians, journalists and the many more people who fall victim to organized crime. But there is still so much more to be done to add value to human life and tackle corruption and organized crime. If you enjoyed the ripple effect, please let us hear your thoughts by leaving a review and do share the podcast to bring light to the stories that we heard throughout this series. You can find more podcasts from the Global Initiative at globalinitiative.net, looking at various elements of transnational organized crime. I'm Ana Paula Oliveira. Until next time, take care.